it is just a huge honor today to be podcast interviewing Sam Middlestead. Thank you so much for coming on. He is our beloved editor and creative director at Ferrand Media, which you probably know as Dental Town, Ortho Town, and Hygiene Town magazines. He's a 30-year veteran in the publishing industry with stints in newspapers, magazines, content marketing. He's lived here in Phoenix for 20 years by way of Montana and Colorado. He won't tell us why the sheriff made him leave Montana, and then he fled to Colorado, and then the sheriff ran him off. You're working your way down. Montana, Colorado, I Arizona. Have, I have. So you'll be probably in Mexico this time uh, next year. I hope so. And then uh, eventually end up and retire in Brazil. Um, I thought it'd be awesome to have him come on the show to talk. You know, we, we make a magazine every month since 1994. And so what what makes a good article? Why, why have we been successful for 20 years? And how can we be more successful? And how can we get, um, and, and if one of my homies was listening to you saying, I'd love to write an article, what, what, would, what would you tell them? Yeah, uh, we, you know, we see that every once in a while on the message boards, which is someone's, oh, I need to publish in a dental industry magazine. Or they're, you know, they're just people who are curious about publishing. Um, so I would say, you know, generally we have the very first thing that comes to mind for us is I don't have the experience in the dental industry. I am not a clinician. So we have Tom Jacoby, who looks at it from the clinical point of view, um, as far as like, how is this dentistry? Are you drilling correctly? Is this the right material? Is this this? I'm really looking at it from the real industry expert um, as far as publishing goes, which is how interesting is this story? So. Uh, it, co- it goes back to my very first newspaper job where I did this really great story. I wrote it, submitted it. All the transitions were beautiful. I used the words I wanted to. It was great. And I turned it in and my editor turned it back. And at the written at the top was just the words, so what? Question mark. And what I had forgotten was, why should we run this article? That was, you know, that's, that was her question. Why do we want to run this article right now? And for us, we're sort of looking for that same thing in a general kinder perspective, which is that, you know, if someone says, hey, I filled a filling today, good for you, but what is the readership going to find interesting about that? You know, it's like, are they, if they say, oh, I do this every day, then they're not going to be interested in that article unless, did something go wrong? Was it your very first one and there's a lesson involved? What, did the patient freak out? Was there something, what is the lesson that was involved or what makes this interesting for our entire readership of general dentists? And so that's, I think our overarching question, no matter what the topic is, you know, it's it's really about just saying what's interesting. That's the by and so, large, the largest so, part. So, um, you started newspapers yeah. in Montana. Yes. What what magazines have you been with? So I started in newspapers. Uh, I was in college, and I was an English lit major, and I needed a part time job to cover my rent and bills. My parents pay my t- tuition, but I had to pay for all of my living expenses, and I found a job as an obituary clerk at the newspaper at night. So it was perfect hours, it was 4 p.m. to 9, you know, and it just got me in the newspaper industry. And then as I realized I was going to be uh, a bad teacher, which I had always thought I would be a great teacher, until I realized that kids don't. I I was a kid who loved English. Like, I loved reading, I loved grammar, I loved all that kind of stuff. And once you realize that every other kid on earth is not wired like you are, and it's going to be hard to teach them that, I was like, oh, crap, what am I going to do with this English degree? Um, and I just stayed in newspapers. And so I started out as a page designer, uh, and then I went to copy editing. Uh, then I became, then, and that's when I moved to Colorado for my first full-time, you know, oh, I got a job with benefits kind of thing. Stayed there for five years, and then moved here uh, to Phoenix for an entertainment publication. And that was what started me on the features side of things. Stayed with newspapers for 10 years and then moved over to custom publishing, which is magazines. So my company did a lot of magazines for uh, the Ritz-Carlton. So if you ever stay in the Ritz-Carlton and there's that little magazine, like my company did that for years and years. Um, My clients were USAA. So if you're an insurance insurance company, lots of times customers get those magazines. Like we created that with USAA for them. My client was CBS, so the TV network had its own magazine. So that's where I got my foundation in magazines. And then eventually I moved over here so that I have all of that industry knowledge and that's sort of what I'm applying. That's where my expertise comes into the to, to dental town, hygiene town, and ortho town. Well, I have to tell you, uh, you know, we have uh, every single comment on you. Everyone loves you. 
Oh, good. I mean, so, yeah. Yeah, every, everybody is a raving man. I mean, they're like, oh, yeah, Sam's cool. It's like, oh, my God, I love Sam. <laughs> I mean, they do. Um, grammar, um, you know, you know, things change over time. But oh, yeah. I, I think with texting, grammar's gone. I mean, everything's abbreviations, yeah. dot, dot, dot. I mean, I almost think grammar's... I mean, I, may, maybe all four of my sons are illiterate, <laughs> but, I mean, no, no one... No one spell checks a text. I mean, everything's abbreviated. Do, do you? Um, I once tried to send one of my coworkers a text disguised as somebody else, and she clocked it as me because she's like, nobody else uses complete sentences and punctuation. Oh, yeah. Like, right. I still do. But yeah. everybody, like, everybody else no, does not. If you spell out Y-O-U instead of let it, using the letter U, you're technically doing it wrong. Like, there are so many... It's code switching. The way that you speak in front of... Uh, the president of the United States isn't the way that you speak in front of your friends at home. And it's the same for methods of communication, where the way that you, you know, send something to your friend as a text isn't the same way that you talk to your boss at work. Yeah. Uh, I, I notice uh, email is pretty more literate, mm -hmm. but text is just falling off the cliff. Yeah. I mean, text is just like a drunk hillbilly yeah. fell down the stairway with a cell phone in his hand. Um, so what would surprise you the most? You, you, you've been uh, running Dental Town Magazine, Ortho Town Magazine for a couple of years now. What, what would surprise you the most now looking back that you didn't see coming when you uh, entered the world of dental <laughs> land? Literally the thing that surprised me the most that I didn't see coming is we ran a story by an oral surgeon that I will remember for the rest of my life. Fayette Williams. Um, by, 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 Bifid on Dental Town? Uh, is it Bifid Uvula, I think? Yeah. Real name Fayette Williams. And it was a, like it was something that you had flagged, actually. It's like, oh, this is a really cool... Blew my mind. Yeah, basically this woman had uh, cancer in her mandible, and they ended up having to remove basically the lower part here. And he went in and opened up her leg, took out her fibula, not her tibia, uh, and while it was still attached to the leg at the bottom, uh, put implants on it, uh, cut off, put grafted it onto her chin, and like sewed her up, and she walked out of the hospital. Which is a cool story, but I didn't realize the photos would be there in the article. So when the word doc arrived, and there are these photos embedded in it, it's eight fifteen in the morning, and I'm eating my breakfast in front of my desk, like, and all of a sudden, literally, there's a woman whose leg is just slashed open by a surgeon, and I was, I was like, oh my. God, like, so I had to read the article with my hand over the photos, like, as I just kept going for the first couple of times I read it, and then I got used to it eventually, and then after that I started, like, telling my friends, I was like, come in here and look at this article. What do you think this photo is? Um, and by the way, uh, the most interesting answer was a really horrible red velvet cake. And I was like, no, that's actually a woman's face. Like, she's just been flapped. You know, um, he's... Um He's got several cases like that. Yeah. On have you have you gone in and seen yes. his other cases? It's it's fascinating, and it was. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, Dental Town. You know, a lot of people that they, they couldn't even post a case like that on Facebook. They'd be afraid someone. You know, I mean, you know, but so Dental Town, um, you you have to register. We have to know who you are. You have to have a working email. We have two full time employees that validate everybody is is a dentist or works full time in the dental community. But you would not believe some of those cases on dental time. I mean, some of those are mind-blowing. And he has a dozen of those mind-blowing cases. But the first thing um, you should be thinking, Sam's not a dentist. He's an editor. And you put up not pictures that gory on your website, but you still show a lot of blood and gum and pink and all that stuff. The consumer, he's talking about putting his hand up. I go to some dentist websites, and I'm just like, I love it. I'm excited. I'm drooling. But I know people are bouncing off that website page faster than a second yeah. because they're gory, man. The, and your website picture's got to be white and fluffy and pretty and bleaching and bonding of veneers yeah. and show a before and after implant case, missing tooth, she's got a tooth. I don't want to see no titanium. I don't want to see sutures and blood and guts. Yeah. And that's, a good, um, that's another example of like code switching where it's like for Dentaltown, that's exactly what we want to see. We want to see all of those progress steps because that's what all of these professional dentists are really into because they want to see the, pro they don't want to see a before and after because for them that says that you skipped all of, like you didn't tell them everything that happened. So Dentaltown is your place to do that. But when you do have your like consumer facing websites or your public facing stuff, that's where you do keep, you know, it's another, it's another way of like, how do you communicate with which audience? And we're definitely, a Dentaltown is geared toward professional dentists. So. Like whenever we're talking about 
what you're writing, it should always be the, the people who are reading this are educated peers. They're not they're not random people off the street. They're not parents who are bringing their kids in. This is all about like licensed to dentists. Let me tell you about my two biggest mistakes with Dental Time Magazine. One, you know, I'm from Kansas. Um, Ryan, how many how many guns did your grandma have? Probably like fifty. Fifty. <laughs> does she have an AK forty seven? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how many deer has she shot? Probably like ten. Yeah. She, th does she have her own deer blind? Yeah. Yeah. So we ran a story of this guy in Missouri that had a archery deer hunting, and you know you do that in the you want to be out there before the sun rises. Right. You know, animals only move when it's sunrise or sunset. They yeah. bed down the night and the day. And, uh, and, then, and then to make it a CE traveling business expense, um, I was the lecturer from like uh, uh, 10 to 2, and then everybody you know cleaned up, and then they went back out. And but we were in that picture, and it was a dentist. His wife was a vet, and they were sitting there with the, the trophy killed right. the deal. Yeah, oh, my God. We got more hate mail from that. You'd almost think I had murdered the last penguin on Antarctica, <laughs> or, or, or just kill, you know. I mean, it was, it was crazy. I mean, and I'm not exaggerating. I bet, I bet we got a thousand letters <laughs> of insult. The second dumbest thing I did, and I, 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 I don't regret this. I'd do it again tomorrow, but my team won't let me. <laughs> when I was little. Um, my dad, he worked harder all day. I mean, he had a restaurant. So, you know, when you own a restaurant, it's seven days a week. It's from, you know, when the sun yeah. come up, you're there, and, and he'd get home 11 or 12 night. My, my whole childhood, the only time I saw my old man was when I went to Sonic. And I loved it because I, my choice was stay home with my five sisters playing Barbie dolls or walk down to the restaurant and get all the free hamburgers, cheeseburgers, see your dad, all these fun teenage employees yeah. that were all exciting. I, I loved it. And a lot of my teachers, um, um, you know, thought it was bad that, you know, I was working so many nights and evenings, but I was playing. I, I never worked a day in my life for my dad. It was just a blast. But on, when it came to vacation, it was the same vacation every year. He only liked two things. He liked Six Flags over Texas, Disneyland. He liked theme yeah. parks and seeing stuff made. So, like, we would go to, uh, so we went and visited Budweiser in St. Louis. We did the arch thing. Yeah. Did the bear tour. One time we bought a station wagon and we drove all the way to Detroit and got on this electric golf cart tour bus and what followed our car from the beginning until it rolled it off the assembly line. We went to Coors. Like, you might not know this in Denver, but did you know old man uh, Coors, Adolph Coors? He made his own bottles. Mm -hmm. And for a while, that technology for the glass, he made dental porcelain. So no, a lot of yeah. dental labs back in the day making porcelain fused to metal crowns were using Adolf Coors porcelain. So I saw all these factories. Well, I, I extended that to my kids. So like when we, we go on vacation in Los Angeles and they were little, two, four, six, eight, we go visit Future Donics. Um, we go into Glidewell, Jim Glidewell personally showing my four boys all these labs. Um, we were up in Portland, Oregon, went to uh, Ken Austin, uh, showed them the whole A deck where you have this factory. And in one end, they're, they're delivering uh, pellets of leather and beads and wood. At the other end comes off an A deck chair. And Ken Austin walked all four of my boys through the process. And, and what was also cool is his hobby is restoring old cars. So he has a museum, uh, I mean, fire trucks, police, I mean, an amazing collection of cars and uh, um, Ryan we got to get Ken Austin on this show um, but anyway um, so I did the corporate profile because I'm showing you a vacation so on the cover of Dental Town for years would be a corporate profile you know you buy products from ADAC and Glidewell and all these 3Ms and companies so let, so we do like a three or four page spread, but the dumb dentist would say, oh, it's a rag. It's all sponsored by advertising. Uh, they're just trying to sell stuff as, as if they're a volunteer dentist doing free crowns. No, no. Yeah, they're charging $1,000 for a crown, but when 3M tries to sell them something for $30, they're selling something, you know? And I love the corporate profile, but dentist would uh, say it made it look like it was a throwaway rag because you had some big advertising piece on the cover, and I don't know how, I, I could have called it Dentist Town, and I own Dentist Town, but I didn't want to call it Dentist Town because I call it Dental Town because if you took away 500 dental companies, I'd be sitting outside on a rug chucking teeth with shit I bought at Home Depot. 
Yeah. The only reason we look so good is because those companies are making CBCTs and CAD cams and nickel titanium and apex locators. And I love the corporate profile, but now, uh, you know, so we killed it. Ooh, it's still there. What do you mean it's still there? Corporate profiles are still there. They're, but, so starting in the past. They're not on the cover. They're not on the cover. They're on the cover of Orthotown, but not on Dental Town. Um, so why, why, well, what, so why is that? So. Why the difference? I think for, for the reason that you mentioned, for, as far as the cover's concerned, but we also took the cor corporate profile in a different direction a little bit too, because what we were noticing is that people were saying, if you do four pages about a company and I'm a dentist and I already know that I'm going to, uh, I already have a competitor. You know, I always, this is my guy. I'm not going to, and I see this four page art article and it's about a company that I'm not interested in. I literally just turn the pages and that's, as far as a magazine goes, it's a scary opportunity to have that person put away the magazine. So what we've started doing more and more for the companies is we ask, we work with them on, it's still four pages, but we say, hey, why don't we work on an article that helps dentists somehow improve their game? Three pages of it is that, and then the fourth page is, here's a profile of the really smart people who just gave you this three page article. So an example of it, I think the first one that we did that was, I think worked well was um, a marketing company. And so the main article was like 10 ways to improve your postcards. And it was like the article had a big postcard and it, from our perspective, if you just looked at the spread, you'd be like, oh, that looks like a postcard I get in the mail every day. But what they had done is they had said, look, you should have put this here instead. If you had put this photo here instead, you could have increased your game by this much. And so we went through and dissected the front and back of the card, giving people useful information that even if they're not interested in that company, there's still tips that they can use in their own practice. And that way, it's still useful to me. And that's something that we brought from the, com the, the company that I worked with for magazines it was content marketing. And our whole thing that was really hard for us to get across to our clients, but was ultimately the, the biggest takeaway that they needed to get was that anything that you send to people needs to be about those people. It can't be about you. Like if you're a hospital and you're like, I'm gonna send out a, a four page magazine and it's all about my new um, birthing center. People are gonna be like, I'm not having a baby, Shh, throw it away. But if you say, I'm gonna do a four page magazine and it's about moms and things that you need to know about taking care of your kids and it's tips and maybe it's things in the neighborhood um, and there's a little mention on the side that says, by the way, we just opened this birthing center and it has like this really cool this and this and this. You've given them three pages of stuff that you're like, oh my God, they really care about me. They're really interested in me. And then that fourth little segment is all about you. And so that's what we're doing more and more for the corporate profiles too, is really asking them to rethink what, they're, what they want to focus on. And we want to focus on the dentists as much as possible and the orthodontists for Orthotown, hygiene, hygienists for Hygiene Town, and really have it be, these are tips that help your business or your practice, you know, your clinical practice. If it's about tools, you know, we don't want it to be like, this is all about my tool. We want it to be like, here's how you figure out which tool is the best for you. Which instrument should you be using? This and this and this. And then when she, the reader is like, oh God, this is really smart. Then that last page is like, here's the smart people who just told you this. And they probably have a lot more info if you get in touch with them. So that's what we do for the corporate profile now. Okay, but you're, you're talking to Dennis, and you just say content marketing. Yeah. They don't know what that means. What, exactly. What, what, what does content marketing mean? How is that different than marketing? All okay. right. So content marketing, you know, it started out, and it used to be called custom publishing. And so it is like the Ritz-Carlton magazine, where technically when you look at that magazine, you know, there's really great travel stories in it. There's usually some, like, high-end living things, all that kind of stuff. Ultimately, the whole goal of that magazine is to make you want to book another Ritz-Carlton magazine, or Ritz-Carlton Ritz room somewhere. You want to go on an adventure in this city. like the you know, you know what I thought every time I read the Ritz-Carlton magazine, because I've stayed in a lot mm -hmm. of them, I wanted to eat a Ritz cracker. <laughs> that was the only The buttery, the buttery goodness my, of my a Ritz cracker. Um, hospitals, same thing, where it's, uh, again, it's content marketing, where you want people, you want to get the message out about your stuff, but it's not a hard sell like regular marketing is. Where market, you know, where, for example, for dentists, you know, there's a difference between I offer, you know, if I, if I got a postcard in the mail and it was like, I offer um, f fillings, you know, for 45 bucks. Uh, I personally have never had a filling in my life. Like I've never had a cavity. The only, you know, only fillings I have are preventive kind of things. So you know why like, you've never had a cavity? Uh, no. 
the vodka is killing them. <laughs> the streptococcus mutans no. are causing it. I was lucky because I didn't go to a dentist for seven years when I first moved to Arizona because I was like, I don't know a dentist. So there could have been an opportunity to go horribly wrong, but it did not. Again, knock on wood. Um, but marketing, you know, in different realms, it's more about connect, making that connection. Instead of saying you're making it a sale, you're making a connection with the, re with the reader or the recipient because that way they think that they're, they know or think that you're on their side. You know, it's not that you're like, I want to fill 17 fillings today. They're like, you're like, I want to fill this filling because it's important because your tooth will fall out if, it, if it's not. And so it's the difference of, and that's the difference uh, really between true, like hard marketing and content marketing. And it was really hard for a lot of companies to, to walk that line of really saying, you know, our whole, our whole role was to say, remember, it has to be about the reader. It can't be about you. And so it is, you, a lot of times you're just turning it on your head. And after a while, you get used to it. Um, but it does, it's, it's new and for a lot of people. I'm a big fan of your blog, sammiddlestat.com. So his first name Sam. Yeah. His last name you spell it M I T T E L S T E A D T. That has to be German or German or German. It, it is German yeah. and German and German. Um. So, um. You know they always say that your website you should have a blog. Is, is your blog content marketing? And and why why do you have a blog? And and is a dentist yeah. blog on his website? Um. I, I don't know anybody at SEO that doesn't say, um, you know, if you want more SEO, you got to have some embedded YouTube. I mean, they're all doing Google searches. Mm -hmm. um, they're saying, you know, um, blog. Um, they're saying that if um, Google, you're looking for a dentist in this uh, community and nothing's changed on 80% of the websites, well, they're not going to show up on page one. Right. They like websites that are getting landed on. Mm -hmm. Staying on verified and verified. So, is is a blogging content marketing? It can be. Uh, and, the, and why do you blog? And what is your blog about? So, I have two. That the the one that you mentioned is actually my. I am an editor and a professional, like print professional kind of thing. So that just shows like what I've done. So as Ryan a, sent me his other blog. Yeah. So it's like freelancing. What, what's the name of your other blog? It's just Samit S A M M I T T. Dot WordPress. Dot com. Say it again. Samit, S-A-M-M-I-T-T dot WordPress dot com. Is Samit a, a play on damn it? It is. Samit and it's dot a, blog dot com? Yeah, because it, it used to be a, it is Sam Middlestead. So it just, it's a carryover. That was my blog at my newspaper. And they, they let me get away with it. So I was so pleased with that. <laughs> So, so your, um, so your Sam Middlestead is, you're kind of like, um, Content marketing, selling you, yeah, exactly. Like so, your LinkedIn profile, so you have exactly professional that, yeah, so, exposure. So it's freelance stories that I've written for other publications. Um, so like when I got to tour the Frank Lloyd Wright house that's in Scottsdale, they, you know, the, it's the David Wright house technically is for his son, and there's the preservation instinct for it. Like a magazine needed someone who was local to go out tour it and do a story about it, so. I got to go out and literally walk through the house and do a tour of it. So that's kind of cool. So it's just sort of a, that's really sort of like the, um, like the online resume more than anything else. Most, most publishing well, people will have that. Well, um, but that's not a blog. I would say the other one is more of a blog, the Samet one. And that's where it's random thoughts and just, but that's not, that one isn't really content marketing because that's just sort of, that's Sam who's running around on the weekends and like, like here's a hotel I stayed at and this was a, cute room or this was an awful room or you know this is a drink that I made for the you know like this party stuff like that so that's not really like a content marketing thing because that's just sort of like and I love your police mugshot photos they were so, <laughs> thank you they were so good yeah. um but I, I, I guess I want, I want to go back to that dentist website because yeah. um when um there's so much data you know we sell the invisible I mean, when you go buy bottled water, I, I don't need to see that. I mean, it's Nestle, it's bottled water. I assume there's no arsenic in it. Yeah. It's cold, refreshing. When I buy an iPhone, there's no chance I'm going to go to a jewelry because it took me a decade to figure this damn thing. I'm yeah. too freaking old to figure out a new operating system. The boys, this one, uh, when he came home from college, convinced me that I had to switch to Macintosh. So I committed to it. Ken bought me the nicest Macintosh computer, and I said, I'm going to commit to a month of this. After a week, I was just thinking of ways I could kill myself, you know. Uh, uh, I mean, it, it was the worst experience of my life. Really? Oh, my mine. God. I, oh, my God. But, but, yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Um, but, but 
when you go to the auto mechanic and your engine light comes on and you know that the engine light is a stupid light. Yeah. Because some naive person is going to walk in there and whatever he says, I mean, how do I know if I need to get this maintenance work done? I mean, right. they, they say the weirdest thing, like last time I took in my Lexus, they said, uh, your, your rear axle needs greased. Well, I mean, what, what yeah. do you say to that? Well, and, actually, in dental school, they taught us that. Yeah. We're, and, and so when they come into the dental office, the data is overwhelming. I mean, when you come in the office and I tell you you got four cavities, well, you, you don't know. Right. And if you're referred in by a trusted friend or loved one, you spend $3. Yeah. If you come in off a of flyer, Facebook ad, direct mail piece, you'll spend one. Right. So trust is everything. So when you're writing your blog on your website, should it be more like your Samet? So someone gets to know you, there you are with your dog, drinking a beer, watching right. the Cardinals game, or no. does it... No, and, and that's here's you make a good point. How, how do you build more integrity, trust? So think of it almost like content marketing again. In that, when it, even if you're a mechanic, the same thing. Where if my engine light comes on, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to run to Google and be like, "What does it mean when this light comes on?" And I'm going to research it. And if you have been keeping up a blog for a long time and you've been posting a lot of material, that maybe your answer comes up as one of the most reliable answers and gives me that advice. And I'm like, oh, that again, that company knows what they're doing. And they didn't say, I'll tell you what it is if you come down to my office, you know? And so you've already began to build that connection. And the same would apply for dentistry in that blogs are good, but blogs are a long commitment of resources. It's not something that you can do when you feel like it. And you can see, like my Samet one, the whole reason that it's not like anything like that is because I've literally gone six months without posting because it's not a priority in my life because I'm not marketing myself as a person on that site, you know. Um, but as a, if you're using it for your business, you have to be. You can't have a blog up. And then when people look at a blog, the last post you did was a year ago because then they're like, why is this even here? So you have to commit to having what... Whatever your priority is going to be, if it's once a month, if it's once a week, if it's once a day. And the hard part is feeding that bucket over and over again. We used to do that for our clients in content marketing is we used to have people who would write the articles for them. It's not something that lots of people can do in their spare time because by the time that you make it educational, well, in, well informed, you should probably have a photo in it so it's just not a, a run of text. It needs to like read like you're talking to a person it can't be dentist speak you know when you're talking about a maxilla you know people don't know what a maxilla is that was the other thing the hardest like vocab lessons for me were just like lingual buckle maxilla mandible like all of those things were brand new to me because i'm like is it a jaw is it a tooth is it a molar you know things like you have to speak like that because that's what people are going to google you have to think of like the search phrases that they're going to use you know, they're not going to say um, oral cavity. Nobody, nobody outside of dentistry uses the term oral cavity. Also, it's gross. Don't use it. Um, they say mouth. Well, you know why they switch from oral cavity to mouth? Americans say oral cancer. Well, if you do a search with oral, uh, yeah, the last thing you're going to find US. <laughs> is a dental site. And that is why the United Kingdom formally switched it to mouth cancer. Um, and it was all because of pornography. Um, oral is just not a good search word. Um, and, and what he just said, I still think one of the best things you can do is um, when you look at treatment plan acceptance rates, uh, the dentist doing 750, the, the mean average dentist doing 750 taking home a buck 45, um, their case acceptance on just restorative. We're just talking fillings. No, nothing else. We're not talking about big implant cases, veneers, bleaching, but just decay needing fillings. Um, you only have a 38% closure rate. So you're doing 750 taking home buck 45. Right next door to you is a dentist doing a million three taking home 350. Same number of patients, same everything. The only difference is he has a two and three close rate. And one in three Americans aren't ever going to do anything you said. And they're still adorable, and I love them. There's nothing more exciting than when you come to work and you see uh, your first patient. She's sitting outside your front door in a wheelchair with oxygen tubes in her nose, smoking a cigarette. I mean, you know, um, so people aren't always going to take your advice. Right. Uh, I mean, how many diabetics do you know that drink a two-liter bottle of Mountain Dew every day? 
you know, why, and then, then they take their oral hypoglycemic pill, you know. Um, so, um, so one out of three are never going to do it. But you know what you do? You got an iPhone. When you get to work, tell your assistant or hygienist that when you go in there and do a hygiene check to turn on the recorder and record the conversation. Then you have it take te te uh, text out and you can uh, send these to uh, uh, overnight. And we, we send our podcast uh, scripts to uh, India and they translate them. Um, they put the whole text on the deal. And then you get a black magic marker and you cross out every damn word you said that the patient doesn't understand. I mean, you speak 5,000 words of Latin and Greek, and that's why your close rate is so high. And when I see the dentist closing two out of three fillings getting re restorations versus one out of three, the number one trend I see is how much Latin and Greek you lose. I mean, Latin is a dead language. We don't live in Greece, and, and um, you're a highly educated man, and it was a long learning curve to learn Maxlin by cusp and all this yeah. stuff, and they're just ranting those words off to grandma who, uh, you know, and then wonders why she has no idea. And then the other way to check that is then get with your receptionist and start tracking the whole patient schedule and put a check by every single patient that when they were checking out still had a dental question. I mean, they were in with your hygienist for an hour. She's got four years of Latin and Greek. You did a hygiene check. And then when they're checking out, they're going, now, does, does the implant, does that come in or out? Or is that a, and you're like, you were just with the doctor for an hour when you were in a chair with a mirror and a light and a computer. Now you're standing at a counter asking me dental questions and you enable him. You answer these questions saying, oh, do you still have more questions for the doctor? Well, let me take you right back. And if you kept taking him right back and the dentist realized that every time he has a horrible presentation and they're asking questions out front that you're going to bring him back, that's when he'll finally throw in the towel and buy a treatment plan uh, coordinator uh, to do that because he realizes um, it's just going to ruin his schedule. I mean, tell the front desk, quit answering dental questions after they've seen the hygienist and dentist. Take them back, and it's going to change the way they talk. They're going to talk more succinct. They're only going to use English. Uh, there are no, no Latin and Greek. Keep it simple, stupid, and then you'll get your clothes right up, and then your patients are better served because I'd rather my four kids go to a dentist that convinced them to do two out of three of their cavities filled instead of one out of three. Yeah. So, so what if they're listening to you right now um, and they, they want to be published? Um, how do they contact you? What are you looking for? How, how does yeah. this process start and work? Easiest thing is always through email. I'm not a big phone call person just because phone calls can spiral out of out of control when you're talking to someone and like it could be like oh I only need five minutes but by the time you get into the weeds of things it's like 25 minutes later you know there's so normally what's your email uh, it's easy sam at foranmedia.com now are you also at sam at dentaltown.com I don't know I think I think they are set so that they redirect so normally what we ask and Tom Giacobbe who's the clinic uh, clinical director is the same way like really it's the idea of like just shoot us a quick line that says hey you know I'm really interested in writing an article about this and then just kind of like list out the bullet points of like the angles or like the topics what specifically are you going to talk about um, so that if it is you know we're working with someone now about incisal edge closures and so it was more about what are you going to talk about with those? Because those can go in so many different directions. And one thing that I'm really keen to do is rather than cover something once broadly and wipe out our ability to cover it again in two more issues, three more issues, I'd rather cover something very specific, very deep, so that if we're talking about an oral surgery thing, you know, it's like, it's, it's not the idea of like, I'm going to cover everything you need to know about it. I'm like, tell me about one thing. It's the difference between telling somebody Oh, you should bake an apple pie. It's like, I don't want to tell people they need to bake an apple pie. I need you to give me the exact recipe to make an apple pie. I need you to tell readers exactly what they need to do. So it's the same thing about like, oh, you should just, you know, do this closure. And it's like, no, you don't just say do the closure. Like, you have to say, how did you do this closure? What materials did you use? How long did that take? Did you screw up when you did it? Like, all of those things are details that I want to know because that's what makes your story you. And that's what the, the readers want to know because they want to know what they're up against. If they want to practice it in their own practice. I think it's a lot of, so at the beginning, it, it's just really high level, just sort of like, this is the overarching subject. And then this is what I'd like to say about it. One of the other challenges for us is to really say, is to have potential authors come back and, and really take a look at what have we published in the past year? 
Because a lot of times someone's like, oh, I really want to do something about, uh, you know, improving your social media presence. And I'm like, we just covered that two months ago. And we did it again six months ago. Like, we specifically did, we had Zuckerberg on, Mr. Zuckerberg did that thing on Facebook. We had someone else who specifically did a thing about Instagram and for dentures patients, you know? So we're getting very specific about things. It's not like how to improve your social media presence. It's how do you use videos in your, on your, you know, um, call and receiver uh, is doing, did a thing and it was not just, you know, how do you use video in your social media, but he actually gave examples. There's a video on our website that he made for us that was like, here's a good example and here's how it could be improved to a bad example. So Beaver, think that we want to have very specific advice in there because that's what's going to help our readers. It's not, it's not the level of giving them generalities. Give them as much specifics as possible. Um, what comes to your mind when I say WCGW? Zero things. Um, that's a subtitle on Reddit, uh, What Could Go Wrong? Ah. And I am so bummed I can't remember his name. He was a prosthodontist. That in his final years before he passed, he um, worked at Green Dental Lab. He was a consultant for the big cases coming in. Um, gosh darn, what was his name? Green uh, Dental Lab consultant? The Green Dental Lab in Arkansas. He was a prosthodontist. He was a dentist. Um, one of the most famous prosthodontists in the world back in the 80s and 90s. But what I loved about him... And what I think would be better for dentistry and Dental Town Magazine is, um, you know, there's a lot of really good studies that say the more hours you spend on social media, the more depression you have because everybody's posting their best, their, best, their best. best picture. When that girl's eating pizza at the parlor with her girlfriends, how many selfies do you think she took before she posted one? And did she crop it and filter it yeah. and change it? So you're so it's you're living in this world where you think everybody's got this perfect leave it to beaver wally wonderful life and he would get up there did you find him ryan i just sent you a text to charles english charles english ryan you're so damn good how did you find you're that like having a siri oh my god look at his picture his obituary knows charlie english charles english my god what year did he die it says november 3 2005 and Charlie, it's 12 years later, and we're talking about you. Hope you can hear this. Dr. Charles Edward English of Little Rock. Died on Thursday, November 3rd, 2005. He was born in Lebanon, Indiana. But what he did is he said, you know what? I'm not going to stand up here and show you my thousands of perfect cases. I'm only going to show you everything that went wrong. So that, number one, so that you realize that the greatest lecturers on the circuit who are up there, you know, they'll do a hundred veneer yeah. cases and just show you the one and it's going to be perfect and she's going to be yeah. gorgeous and everything went out perfect. And I, and I, and a lot of us think a lot of their stuff could be photoshopped. Right. And, and Charlie Ingram says, you know what, when you do something and it turns out perfect, I don't think you learned anything. Yeah. But let me show you what could go wrong. And, and he always said, I learned the most by all my dental abortions. That's what he called them. And, 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 and I learned so much. Like, I can't tell you how sad I felt when I was, when uh, Jan and I went to a nursing home and this lady back in, in the 80s came in and didn't want her partial. So I did two implants and two, three unit bridge. And then 20 years later, she's in a nursing home. She's frail. She's sick. And one of them uh, uh, fails. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, if I would have put three implants for three crowns. Two would have stayed. I could have taken out that failed implant and nothing would have changed. But right. since I saved 150 bucks on a middle implant and did a bridge, now she's going to lose two out of those three teeth. And at that age, they're too sick and frail. No one's going to do surgery on yeah. them. And, and, uh, and I loved Charlie's cases. And he was so good. Carl Misch yeah. used to be sitting in the audience when this guy was lecturing. And, um, and yeah, so I wish we had a section like Reddit, call it WCGW. What could go wrong? Now, on Reddit, it's always like, uh, um, I'm... Burgers. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm going to drink a beer by, yeah. oh, you know, so, something. It's always, I'm, I'm going to slide down the stairway yeah. on my drunk, passed out friend. What yeah. could go wrong? You know, and then it's always a disaster. But I wish Dentaltown um, would start um, encouraging uh, what is your worst case? Photo yeah. document the biggest disaster you ever did 
because I think we'd all learn more. We'd all learn more from the accidents. Yeah. What could go wrong? That's what we should call it. What could go wrong? Or what did go wrong? Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of readers are probably afraid of what the online community would say. Like, you know, when you go on the forums right now, and there's there's already just that, like you're talking about with social media, the lack of face-to-face communication, I think, makes people more feel more free to criticize. And I think that a lot of, especially dentists and other professionals, are kind of leery about put, opening themselves up to that criticism, which is a tough thing. But, you know, when we, we started... Um, a department which is uh, a shorter piece that usually appears every issue called show your work and that was designed to if people are hesitant to write a larger article i'm not an author i'm not a writer i'm a dentist and we understand that but everybody has like a really cool case so we have this feature up front and it's called show your work we're literally we're just asking you show us this cool case Show us your photos. We have to have good photos. Um, and be able to describe all the steps that happened and, and tell us what was cool about it. Again, that's, you know, over and over again, that's what it's going to come down to is like, what's cool about this particular case? Was the patient, like, particularly challenging? Did you did something screw up? You know, we recently did one where it was a guy who did his very first implant case. And, which normally, you know, everybody remembers their first implant case, probably every dentist. But this guy also, when he got there, he couldn't use the guide because she couldn't open her mouth wide enough. And so then he was like, now what do I do? And then he had to kind of punt. And so like, that was an interesting thing because, he, you know, it wasn't just, and then everything worked perfectly and it went according to plan and I was done. You know, people are sort of, on one hand, the, the patients are incredibly grateful for that, I'm sure. But their dentists who are reading are like, and I learned what here, you know. And so I think that, you know, we're always looking for people who are willing to share their cases. That's for us. One of the biggest things is, you know, a lot of times when we're looking for authors, you know, we have a year's worth of topics that we already have planned in an editorial calendar. So we'll cover orthodontics X number of times a year. Oral surgery is scheduled X number of times a year. And we're always looking for people. How could my homies find that editorial calendar? It is on our website, I believe, under editorial. Um, Or maybe it's under sales. For us, we would just rather have them call or email and say, hey, I'm really interested in writing an article about this because we're not, those are the minimum number of times per year we want to cover it. That doesn't mean that if a great case doesn't comes in and we're like, oh, sorry, we've already scheduled an ortho thing. We're not going to run a really interesting piece earlier if we have the ability to do it. So it's really about- I'm going to submit an article uh, and also it has uh, director uh, Tom Jacoby. Yeah. And he's me. been on our team since 2000. He's been on that team 17 yeah. years. And Lori has been um, the president of that company for 19 years. Right. I am the luckiest man on the world that uh, those guys have been there. And, and the, the guy who wrote the first line of code on Dentaltown, Ken Scott, Ken. 1998. Yeah. He's still there. Um, those guys are just uh, legends to me. They've uh, they built that whole company. I hate it when people give me credit for... Uh, Dental Town and all this stuff like that. When, uh, God damn, if anybody should get credit for Dental Town, it should be Ken Scott. <laughs> he programmed the whole damn thing. Um, but um, are there any more? Um, so mo- it sounds to me like you're in Tony's dentist. You mostly want clinical cases. Is that we we love clinical cases because readers love clinical cases. A lot of times we have so many people out there who who either you know practice management consultants are the experts in practice management field and i know that there are a lot of dentists out there who are trying to redefine themselves as also i'm i'm leaving clinical practice and now i'm going to work more on finance or something like that we have a ton of people who are doing that already too so that's a that's a harder you know we already have more contenders in that field so it's harder to say Yes, there's a new idea in there. Clinical cases for us are always we're hungry for. But I'm, I'm going to say something on the record. Um, I refuse to ever be on the cover of my own magazine because it's kind of, I mean, it'd be like getting Time Magazine Man of the Year if you were the owner of Time Magazine. I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of narcissistic. You're on the cover for January. I'm on the cover of January. Yeah. For what? Sneak peek. Uh, it is a preview of. Not all of the speakers at Townie Meeting, but a dozen of them, and you're one of the dozen. Okay, so I'm just a thumbnail. Yeah. Um, but I just want to say, on the record, I tell them at Townie Meeting, I mean, I've spoken at that meeting every year, 15 years, I say, I don't have to be on the program, and you're the editor, and I've ran a monthly column since 1994. Yeah. They don't need another column from Howard. If you ever sit there and say, you know how we're going to retire your column, or we're going to go to once a quarter or once a year, <laughs> trust me. 
I, I'm cool. I don't ever think that um, poor Howie has to have a <laughs> monthly column. I mean, but the numbers, you know, we look at the numbers on how things are doing on the website, and that informs how we decide what to do more of and less of too. And your column is number one or number two almost every month. So, is is it really yeah. number one or number two? Yeah. And and he's usually number two. Um, it depends. Usually, it's something that's on the cover, which I think is a, a direct correlation to when people see the the HTML version of the magazine. The cover's there, and they can click and see something that's on on there. But but you got data that um, they're more likely to click a clinical case. We haven't looked at it that that gran I hate that word granularly. We haven't looked at it that deep, in terms of you know normally we just kind of look issue by issue and say oh this one did really good quizzes do really well for us so when we did that um, name that oral lesion, which is another phrase that I never thought that I would say out loud in yeah. my life, but it was the name that oral lesion that's yeah. the that's the game you want to play when you're on your date with yeah. uh, some chick from Plenty of Fish. No, name that oral yeah. lesion. That one actually did. <laughs> Like incredibly well, where it was that was that out that shown your column by almost like fifty percent. I was like, people love a quiz. I think. Yeah, um, but you know how I really um, and I'm going to ask the community about uh, what could go wrong, Be because yeah. here here's another beef I have with the the big um, dental meetings is, you know, um, you, you go to any lab like Glidewell, which does 5% of all the crowns in the United States of America and, the, and their data. I mean, they do millions of crowns a year. And they tell you that 96% come in one at tooth at a time. And you go to all the other labs and most all the labs agree that, you know, 95 out of 100 crowns come in one at a time. Then you go to all the dental meetings and every course on Crown and Bridge is some full mouth rehab. And then I'll stand up and say, okay, it's, uh, it's already, uh, it's almost Christmas. Raise your hand if you didn't do one full mouth rehab case the entire year and all the freaking hands go up, okay? So um, that's another, so they always show these perfect unicorn, full mouth, all on four. I mean, like what percent of dentists that place implants have never done an all on four? Right. Oh, just 99% of the general dentists haven't done all on four. So then you go to the magazines, what is it all on? All on fours. I'd like to see more reality, more what could go wrong, your biggest disaster case. And when you're submitting cases, you know, it's not my call, by the way, I have no authority over Dental Town. Tom Jacoby's had that position since year 2000. If I say print it or don't print it, he doesn't even give a shit. I mean, he, he made, it made, it made no impact. But I personally uh, would rather see um, more real world dentists. So I'd, I'd rather read a case on, a, on a, a single unit crown yeah. than a full mouth rehab. I'd rather see a case uh, on a molar endo uh, than a, a retreatment case digging a broken post out of the palatal canal. You know what I mean? Just real world stuff because, yeah. you know, um, and uh, silver diamine fluoride, that, that's a hot topic. Yeah. Um, you know, when you got PETA, I mean, to me, God, you got a screaming, yelling kid and you want to give it a shot and do a pop yeah. out of your chromosome crown when there's people like Janelle. Jeanette, Jeanette McLean. Jeanette, yeah. Ma Jeanette McLean. Yeah. Um, Jeanette McLean, who I just totally worship that pediatric yeah. dentist, I think. She made the cover of the New York Times. Yeah. Her oh article is good. Her CE course on silver diamine fluoride is doing really well. Because she did a print one for us, and then she also did an online one. And both of those, the numbers are really good. But I, I guess what I'm just saying is more real world. Yeah, definitely. You know? That's something that we're all really interested, really keen to get in, because I think that that's more applicable to readers every day. I think the other stuff, you know, the things that we talked about here also apply if dentists are doing like events in their community and they want to try and get it in a local newspaper, you know, and they're sort of like, how do I get press for this cool event? Maybe they're doing like free treatment for kids or something. It's again, like when you talk to that local media, you have to think about, uh, what's the interesting angle here? You know, if it's, I'm doing a cool thing for people, that's, it's nice, but you need to have a little bit more than that because depending on what city you in, there could be five or six other dentists who are all doing that same thing that weekend. And so it really comes down to knowing what is your angle going to be? Um, you know, we had a profile of, I think, some orthodontists who had an event and they brought some Arizona Cardinals and they had, you know, so there's some sort of additional level to it. So it was really more about at that point, when you're talking to a community newspaper, what's the benefit to the community? Like lead with that. And I think more and more it's the idea of just knowing that when you're selling a story or trying to pitch just to get some media, you know, valid media for what you're doing, 
that you need to remember sort of like the timelines that people work under. Um, even for daily newspapers, when I worked in the features section, you know, I would write, you know, we're not writing, we're not breaking news for features. And so we're not going out on Wednesday and publishing for Thursday's paper. You know, we're starting things a week or two in advance. And so you can't call up and say, hey, today I'm doing this cool thing because chances are when they're doing their breaking news, you know, the TV stations, newspapers, all that kind of stuff, they've dedicated that day's things to breaking news. They're not going to they're not going to run out and do a feature piece. Um, so that's something that you call a week ahead of time and let them know, say, you know, and, and ask what sort of coverage is available. Maybe it's not going to be the cover, but maybe can I just get a photo? Can we provide something? Can we pitch it ahead of time? Because a lot of times feature magazines and, and newspaper sections, they're not trying to cover it when it happens. They want... It's, they, it's just the nature of the beast that if readers are interested in it, they want to know if they have a kid that can qualify for it. They need to know about it ahead of time. And so that's another thing to keep in mind. You know, same for Dentaltown. Right now it's, well, today it's, what, December 12th. We're almost done with January. We go to the printers next week. Uh, we've already nailed down our February lineup. March content is due January 15th, and I'm already talking about stuff for August. We have a lot of stuff, wheels always moving, and so just know that like a lot of times if it's like, I'd like to get something in March, and it's like, oh, you might not be able to because we might be full. The um, richest man in the world is now um, um, Jeff Bezos of Amazon, number two is Bill Gates of Microsoft, but number three is Warren Buffett. And he lives in Omaha, Nebraska, and that's yeah. where I went to college, Craig University. And he actually came out and spoke um, at our school one time. But you, you started off in newspapers, and yeah. Warren owns 31 newspapers. They're probably all small. 31 newspapers. But he says, um, he, he said um, just yesterday on, um, he said, if you look, there are 1,300 daily newspapers left. There were 1,700 or 1,800 not too long ago. Now you've got the Internet, aside from ones mentioned, um, they haven't figured out how to make the digital model complement the print model. Do you do you think newspapers are, are um, well, there used to be, when I got out of school, there were 15,000 dental labs. Mm -hmm. And now there's only 7,500 because all the, the ones that all died were the one man shows. Right. You have too much equipment. A couple of years ago, there were 1,800. Now there's 13. Now that's down 500. Yeah. 10 years from now, our newspapers... How many newspapers would be left? Are they going to die? And Bezos, the richest man in the world, he bought the Washington, Washington Post. Post. Yeah. Now, I don't know if he bought that because that was a good business or because he wants political influence in Washington, D.C. The Post comes with added benefits and that it has its own wire service. So newspapers subscribe to the Associated Press, which is sort of like a, it's a news filter that gives them access to certain stories. And the L.A. Times Washington Post has its own news service, too. So because... They have such good writers, it's a syndicate, and other people pay to reproduce their content. So they, they have something that like most daily newspapers don't have, which is, re, is truly sellable content. Like other, other newspapers are picking it up. Um, newspapers really got hit by the internet. They, like Warren was right in that there's, they just weren't prepared for this model that suddenly gave away their two biggest gravy trains, which was classified ads, which was Craigslist, and then Carfinder, which was all of the auto advertising ads. And suddenly, they weren't really able to pivot quickly enough because that's where people were going for their needs, the internet. It was easier to do this than it was to wait 24 hours the next morning until a newspaper came out. Um, and for a long time, they were so busy, I think, I can't speak for the entire industry, but um, it was so much about still good, still focusing on this print product and thinking of the website as an ancillary. Um, when in real life, people are going to the website first and they didn't work on that fast enough. And I think that's sort of what led to the idea of they sh probably should have monetized their content to start with because people are so used to now getting that news from for free. And like the Times has now gone to, New York Times has, and the Washington Post does too, X number of free articles a month, you need to pay, and then you get access to the whole thing. And, and they're making money that way. They're not making hand over fist money like they used to, but they're in a lot better shape than I think some other publications, uh, other titles and magazines, the newspapers are. And by the way, um, if you're listening to this, um, please download the Dentaltown app. Um, we have free classified ads, and there are um, like... 6,000 
free classified ads. They all expire after a certain date, so that nothing's old. Um, looking for associate, looking for a job, selling a practice. I can't. Um, some of these, some of the most successful dental practice brokers on earth are listing all their dental. That's their secret sauce. I mean, they they send me emails. They say thank you. I mean, they they don't. Um, I get wine, cheese, shit melted to the house because they feel guilty because they're listing yeah. all these ads for free, and it's um. Because um, in the old world, it would have been your local state exactly. dental journal that came out once a month, right? And now they're on there twenty four seven. I think of Ryan McCall, like the, he yeah. told he mentioned in his article that he found his practice on Dental Town when he and the other th the other thing is you're selling your practice. Say you're say you're in Phoenix, Arizona. So you put it in the local um, Arizona Dental Association classified ad magazine, great whatever. But the, that's print. But the kid that might be Come to Arizona, might be in the Navy, might be in Okinawa. Yeah. Maybe he got out of school in Florida and he just met some, um, the love of his life and she wants to move back to Phoenix. So, so you got to think international. There's um, some of these dentists uh, post their ads in California and the person that's finding them to buy them is in India. Yeah. And they're, they're starting a negotiation to buy a practice and she's still in New Delhi. You know what I mean? Yeah. So the classified is is amazing. That's a free service that Dental Town does. So so newspapers are dying. Do you, do do you think it's the pendulum where um, it went from eighteen hundred um, and five hundred not very efficient got right. weeded out, and now you're down to thirteen hundred stronger ones? Well, or think, do you think it's just gonna? I think that they're gonna have to redefine gonna, what they are. In that more and more, if they were to redefine themselves as a media company and not a newspaper, and really think about where their opportunity their opportunity lies online really truly it's like there are always going to be people who subscribe to a newspaper for certain things but when you're thinking about what your core customer is looking for your core readership they're looking for facts now and that's the those sort of immediate updates you know when you read about a oh there's an explosion in new york uh, subway explosion. You're not going to wait 24 hours for your print publication to come out to give you that nuanced thing. People want updates now. So they need to have that robust online somehow. And then they can supplement the print as they, as they see fit. And I think that's true. You see it happening in magazines as well, where um, people will have like this very um, vibrant online community. Dentaltown is built that way, where you see millions of posts and you know the message five board, million yeah and the, and the message boards that we print each issue sort of redefine and just reinforce to our readers that this this ongoing conversation is happening all the time there's new topics there's new posts there's all of this is going on so that's we usually publish two or three an issue just from different topics to reinforce the fact that there's so much more online than what's in the magazine too oh my god look at this so we're up to four million nine hundred thousand yeah. posts with 235, so we're about to celebrate two things. Yeah, uh, five, million. five million post and a uh, quarter million at 250, a quarter million dentist. Yeah. And uh, what's so funny is uh, we came out in 98, Facebook came out in 2004, and everybody's been telling me year after year, Facebook should have killed Dentaltown, Facebook should have killed Dentaltown, and then every month we get a thousand more members. Yeah. And the posting is, uh, I mean, more people post, we have more members every month and the month before since we started. And uh, it's it's funny because uh, Facebook is a mile wide and an inch deep and Dental Town is an inch wide and a mile deep. I mean, yeah. when you got five million posts, I mean, you break a file off on an MB2, you know, it's there, the, the cases are there. Yeah. And, and the follow-up questions, I mean, it's just it's just amazing. Um, and, and I also like the, the organized, organized message board format. Yeah. Like, like you say you were the greatest endodontist in the world and and um, and I wanted to find a case of a certain thing. What am I supposed to do? Go to your page and just scroll back forever? Yeah. Uh, it's it's uh, it's organized. It's searchable. I have I've used it a couple times when we were looking for authors. You know, sometimes when we're looking for someone to write about a particular topic, I'll search the message boards and I'll look for people who are posting, especially the people who are answering the questions. Not necessarily people who are asking the questions because they might not. I'm looking for the people who have the answers because I think that the people who have a strong enough of an opinion of themselves that they're going to be posting these answers in these forums are the same people who are sort of bold enough to want to, you know, publish an article that 
you know, puts them at the scrutiny of their, of their fellow dentists too. And so those are the people that I reach out to sort of one-on-one where I'm saying, Hey, we have a story about prosthodontics that needs to happen. You know, would you have any interest in anything? Do you have any interesting cases? So I kind of skulk about. I like the word you You said bold enough. You said strong enough and then be scrutinized by your peers. Yeah. You know, you know, you know what, what you're saying? Um, you know, they always say the greatest fear in life is public speaking. Uh, hmm. But I've never been to a funeral where everybody said, well, at least he's not giving a speech. <laughs> um, um, I th- one, in any community, even when it's your Facebook friends, yeah. 1% of every community, whether it be message boards, dental town, engineers, Facebook, 1% is what they call super users. Right. And their super users create most content. And everybody mischaracterizes them as saying that, Oh, they're thick skinned or they're bold or they're strong or they're going to be scrutinized. Um, It's not that they have thick skin. It's just that they realize that the other seven and a half billion humans are just crazy monkeys and, and they'll put something up there and they do it purely because they want the feedback. Yeah. But some people just shudder. They think, well, if I posted a case, it makes it look like I don't know what I'm doing. And Sam came on and said, that is the worst veneer I've ever seen in my life. That you'd go jump off a building. I yeah. mean, I mean, I mean. I take it back to your family when you're having the big Thanksgiving dinner. What percent of your aunts and uncles are batshit crazy? I haven't been back for Thanksgiving dinner in like twenty years. So I'm a because of that. Uh, no, you know, part of we never really were, were like big, big family. We were nuclear family dinner, and that was it. But yeah, I get the point in that. But what, what, what percent? What, what percent of the my average homie? Yeah. What percent of the, what, what percent of America is batshit crazy? I would always guess that like really, as far as the opinions of people that really matter, like I would say you can probably discount sixty percent of them easily. Sixty percent. Yeah. You can yeah. be like as so long as those forty percent are the important ones. It's not that you're six. Yeah. It's, it's not that guys like me are thick skinned. We just don't spend all of our time. I mean, when I'm making a post, I'm not sitting there thinking, oh, I wonder what Charlie would think yeah. of this. And Larry and Aim. I, no, I'm posting this because I find it interesting. Yeah. And what I love the most about Dental Town is, I can't tell you how many times I'll post something and their minds are so amazing. I mean, they all got eight, nine, 10 years yeah. of college and they, they see stuff in articles that I didn't see. The, the, the questions they ask, I mean, I mean, I remember with someone post. I mean, way back in the earliest day, uh, someone posted a case, and I was looking at this uh, cosmetic case. The first comment was like, uh, "My God, too bad they had four bicuspid extraction. They butchered the whole smile." And I was just a young kid, and I was like, it was like 1998. And I was looking at that thing, and wow, I didn't even, I didn't even yeah. notice the four bicuspid extraction. And I mean, I just love the way um, they everybody sees something different, and I think and just yeah. stop caring. What other people think. And, and another way to explain to this, I'll explain like this. So we know 100 billion, about 100 billion sapiens have come and died before today. And there's 7.5 billion sapiens live today. So, so let's run it off to 8%. So 92.5% of all the humans have come and died. Do you, do you worry what they think? I mean, are t- today, are you going to worry that you're going to make a post and 92% of all the humans that ever lived are dead and aren't going to see it or comment on and it reminds me of a story when I was little. So remember Swin Bicycle? Oh, yeah. So my Swin got a flat tire and all this stuff. And, you know, I had five sisters and dad worked all the time. But but lunch was 11, lunch hour was 11 to 1 and dinner hour is 5 to 7. So my dad's downtime was actually after lunch, he yeah. would come home. And that's when he'd actually take a shower, brush his teeth, shave, do all that, come downstairs, have a robe, maybe eat breakfast with mom or whatever. And um, so he came home one day and I said, um, um, you know, my tires got a fly, you know, uh, mom said, you know, uh, can you help me take it to the shop? So he had his big old Lincoln town car where he pushed a button. You could put the 10 speed in the trunk with the kickstand down. I mean, these monster cars, we drove to the dealership and dad pulled up a sign. He popped his button. And I said, um, well, you know, I got my bike out. And then I went and I said, where well, are you going to go in with me? And he goes, why? And so what should I tell him? He's like, Damn, Howie, go tell yeah. me you're Clem Cladetel Hopper and you want your tennis racket restrung. If you can't tell a man what you told me to get your damn tire fixed, then you shouldn't get it fixed. Let's leave the bike here and go home. So I'm in there and I'm you know, 10 years old and I'm all scared, you know, this stranger. And then Dad told me later, he said, look, Howie, that, this is a long time ago. He said, look, Howie, there's, at that time, only 6 billion. He said, look, Howie, there's 6 billion people in the world. And not one of them has ever thought of you. 
<laughs> so don't ever worry about what someone thinks of you because no one's thinking of you. Uh. They're all thinking about themselves. And he says, if you want anything on this earth, you better climb to the tallest mountain on the tallest tree and scream as loud as you can. And that's how you get something done. And he said, no one will do that because they're, you know, they're afraid uh, someone's going to think of them. And what they don't know is that no one's ever thought of them. Yeah. So don't be afraid of what someone thinks of you, especially when no one's thinking of you. And you're posting in a dental community. And, and the biggest controversy we have on Dental Town is the anonymous. Mm -hmm. And everybody says, well, on Facebook, I know that you're Sam Middlestad. Yeah. Well, yeah, and if Sam says your root canal sucks, you'll just delete them from Facebook. Dentaltown, you can't delete and block a quarter million people. And the reason um, I know who everyone is, we have full, two full-time employees that check, verify everybody on Dentaltown. We know who they all are. But the reason I let them go anonymous, because what's most important for me is a sacred sovereign profession of dentistry, and dentistry needs a place where you can anonymously ask a stupid question. Yeah. And if I take that away from our profession, now I've got some dentist practicing alone. Uh, what, what if you're an endodontist? And you have to um, show a, a failure. Then and then the other end on us sends that link to everybody and says, look, "Look at these questions he's asking on dental day. He obviously doesn't even know endo. I mean, the specialists working on referrals they couldn't ask a question. And um, and the only thing weird about the anonymous was is this is so bizarre. Twice, we've caught someone setting up multiple accounts and started the thread, and they're they're responding talking, to each and other. they're responding to each other. Yeah. And me and Giacobbe and Ken Scott looking at this like, what the? <laughs> I mean, is this guy uh, in completely insane? But uh, um, was he fighting or was he agreeing with himself? Oh, he was being all contrary. It was it was a total drama. Queen. Oh my God, man! We went ten minutes over. They're sitting in the parking lot uh, with their car running, um, <laughs> wanting to go inside. Is there anything that I should have asked that I didn't ask you? Um, I think I think we covered everything, really. It's it's just um, like what makes it different, and everybody ha I think everybody has a different story. Don't be afraid to reach out to us because I think the other challenge that I think a lot of people don't remember is that it's our job to make you look good. Like that's my job. You know, we'll be we'll be really honest about oh well maybe this isn't really a good this isn't a great fit for this for the publication, but what else do you have or you know do you have anything else? Like we're not gonna say oh this is a great thing snicker snicker and then publish you and. and because like, we, that's ultimately our goal is to make the publication look good. And we can't do that without good content. So I think anyone who might be hesitant about, oh, I can't write or anything like that, we'll make it as easy as possible. There are ways to format things to make it easy. You know, oh, English isn't even my first language. We, you know, we help with that. It's like we have an editorial staff who helps helps with that, you know. Um, I, uh, English wasn't my first language. I'm, I was born in Kansas. Uh, and uh, that is definitely yeah. not English. Um, I'll just tell you my secret in writing, um, whether you like my writing or not, is um, I never, ever will write a month. I've done a monthly column every month since 1984. I won't write a column where it's like, okay, Tuesday at 3 o'clock, you're going to write a column. I'm not writing a column until I'm passionate about something, and I just rant. And I don't like to type it because... I, I, so what I do is I meet with Sam, he's got a recorder, and I say, Sam, I want to come by your office and rant about this. And I have the dictaphone. Yeah, and then he has the dictaphone. And then I just come in there and I'm just, I just rant. So what I would say, um, if you're going to write a case, do something you're passionate on. Do and, something where you have to then you're like, yeah. yes. And the other thing is, to, like, we ask you to write the way that you speak. You know, our, you, we know who our audience is, so you th think about that you're talking to somebody, an educated peer at a party. You know, this we, we are a journal, but we're not like a dry, dead journal. We're going to use contractions. We're going to talk about things, like, talk to it like you would a peer, in, in, and it's not, you know, highfalutin sort of language. You know, it's like you want to talk in a regular, like, sort of manner so that people understand that you're talking to them one-to-one, -one, really. Imagine that, you're, imagine that you're speaking to somebody who, so you don't have to go into a lot of background info because, again, our readership is general dentists and specialists too. So you don't have to start from scratch. You can assume that they know what a lot of what you know. But this isn't a textbook. You know, this isn't we're not doing an encyclopedia entry. Like this is a fun article. Like you know, you should be having fun writing about this and that's something that we want to make sure comes through. Well I think you're doing an outstanding job. Thank you. And uh shout out to Tom Jacoby. Thank you for guiding the you, clinical Tom. side. Yeah.
He's, uh, I call him the uh, voice of reason. What I love about Tom is since uh, 2000, uh, what I love about Tom, Lauren, Ken, Stacy, all those people who have been with me 20, 30 years is I'll, I'll, you know, I, I'll throw them five ideas and I'll say, okay, these two are completely crazy. Uh, this one will never work. This one maybe, but you've got one good idea here. You yeah. know what I mean? And, uh, and every time I come to a fork in the road and I send that decision to uh, Howard Goldstein, Tom Giacobbe, Lori, Ken Scott, they always, they're, not only do they always put me in the right direction, but like Jeff Bezos said, um, we, we, our four worst employees um, in Dentaltown in the last 50 years all had MBAs. Mm. And four for four were just dumber than a rock disasters for us. Jeff Bezos says, I don't care about any alphabet suit behind your name. And I don't care. He says, all I care in what he tracks is, okay, he tracks your decision making. Right. And he says, I just want you to be right. I don't care how you got right. <laughs> I don't care if you're from Harvard, Stanford, MBA, high school dropout, GED. And what I can say most about my team is uh, you go back 20 years, they're always right. Yeah. That's pretty damn cool. And, you know, that's a big question. Would you rather be right or lucky? And, you know, they're just... They're just right-minded people. They're just very street smart, reasonable people. Yeah. I mean, Giacobbe's got his doctorate and all this fancy stuff behind his name, but God dang, he is so street smart. He's just yeah. always right. And on that note, thank you, sir. Thank you so much for coming by Casa Ferran. Nice.